Welcome to our two-year retrospective on HTTP2 support in Jetty. Uh, first off, uh, how many of you use Jetty? Excellent. That's what we like to see. So uh, Jetty is a, an Eclipse project. Uh, you can track us on Twitter. These are slightly old slides due to technical difficulties. But uh, we are located at GitHub. Uh, HTTP github.com slash eclipse slash jetty dot project. Uh, we moved out there about a year ago, uh, but we are still an Eclipse project. Uh, we are now in our 21st year, so Jetty is officially as old as Java. Uh, we celebrate our birthday with, with Java and Yahoo, actually. Uh, so the basic tenets of Jetty are uh, high volume, low latency. Uh, promise that this will get back around to HTTP2 here very quickly. Jetty is, is easily embeddable. Uh, we're very popular in the developer community because uh, it's super easy to spin up Jetty in unit tests or on production environments or embed it into your application and what have you. Uh, we're used in lots of different uh, uh, applications, uh, cloud providers like Google App Engine, uh, Google Flex, uh, and then we're also used in um, you know, Eclipse, where the, uh, we run the default help system inside of that as a uh, OSGI component. Anyway, uh, we also have a great standalone server as well, so you can use Jetty however you like. Uh, that's sort of a core tenet of Jetty. We don't care how you use Jetty, we just uh, enjoy that you do. Uh, so that's a little bit about Jetty, and then uh, who are we? My name is Jesse McConnell. I am a founder and CEO of WebTide. Uh, Simone is a lead architect for WebTide and Comet D. We are longtime open source committer or contributors. Uh, I've been a committer on the Jetty project for going on 10 years now. Um, we fully fund the ongoing development of Jetty and Comet D uh, through our 100% developer owned company. Uh, so I've got a couple of uh, painfully obvious uh, points to make. Uh, I'll give a short little story here and there, uh, and then we'll move over to Simone who can give you a little bit more background in HTTP2 and uh, give some of the, the data of uh, the, the actual retrospective aspect of this. I don't think we're gonna get a demo out of this, but uh, it's not a big deal. So uh, first painfully obvious thing is that the business is on the, your business is on the web. I mean, that's about as straightforward marketing as you can get. Uh, by that, we mean that uh, uh, generally there are humans. Uh, they're not all bots interacting with your websites. Um, the uh, core takeaway here is that speed is critically important for your websites. Uh, the, uh, it has influences for the, the human mind, uh, the brain and interacting with your site and that sort of thing, but then it also influences things for uh, uh, like uh, Google page ranks and those kinds of things. So if people are searching for content related to your business or your website, uh, it's the, the faster your website is, the more likely that your uh, you're actually going to come up in search results and, or search results and those sorts of things. Um, a couple of examples. Uh, I'm not going to say that any of these guys are web tied clients or anything like that throughout the presentation. That's not really the case. We're just using this as some sort of public data that uh, backs up the whole speed is important thing. So if you take a look at like Shopzilla, they had a uh, an attempt, or they, they made the effort and they invested in the business to rem uh, drop the page load times from like six seconds to 1.2 seconds, had a 12% growth in revenue and a 25% increase in page views. Uh, Amazon had a, or they, they were able to track down that for every 100 milliseconds that they improved the responsiveness of their website, that was about a 1% growth in revenue. Now, 100 milliseconds is about a third the speed of the blinking eye. So it's not something that you cognitively notice necessarily, but it is something that has uh, your, your brain clues into and makes you more likely to not get frustrated with a site's performance and stuff like that. So 20 years ago, uh, the web looked quite a bit different. Um, the HDB specification, this one's quite often shocking to the young ones in the crowd, but it is actually 21 years, or it's over 20 years old now. Uh, so it kind of makes sense that at this point to take a step back and relook at uh, uh, the, the basic core protocols of the internet and you know, make the modifications required. Uh, so today, things, I'm not saying BBC is a client either. Um, this was from today. So the web today is a lot, uh, a lot more busy, it's a lot cuter. Um, 
And the point is that uh, there's a lot more going on on modern web pages. There's the actual, um, you know, the, the initial request coming into your page XML or page HTML or whatever. And then there's also the huge amount of resources that go behind it. And then there's also the uh, the, the dynamic content aspects of your website and everything. So uh, one of our, let's see, the last year we worked with one of our clients and they're sort of the best case scenario for HTTP2 performance. Uh, they had a traditional uh, Java servlet-based web app that was serving out HTML uh, or HTTP1 uh, one -on traffic. Uh, it had dynamic uh, components to it and they wanted to migrate over to HTTP2. So we were able to uh, with, with virtually no modifications to the web app, uh, you tweak a couple of the components on the, the deploy side of things. Uh, they were blessed in that they had not invested in uh, components on their networking infrastructure around the edges that would uh, prohibit, or prohibit the, uh, the ability to go uh, HTTP point to point from the browser into their, their applications. So they were blessed from that perspective. Uh, but once they made those changes, they were able to uh, generally improve uh, web, uh, the response uh, rendering of the first page. And then because of the dynamic content that they had behind the scenes uh, using like our Comet D project, um, they were able to have uh, reduced latency on the dynamic aspects of the website as well. Uh, I will get in, or Simone will actually get into a little bit more on why we don't, are not giving, you know, actual you will save this much percentage type thing anymore because uh, a lot of that is subject to things outside of your you know, ability as uh, uh, the server side of things. But uh, anyway, uh, the really painful reality too is that the web powers your business. Uh, again, I'm sorry. Uh, but the point here is that uh, it's not just uh, HTTP uh, semantic sitting, uh, driving the traffic into the front page or the front part of your website. Uh, it is actually quite often present behind the scenes as well uh, in data centers and those kinds of things for you know, distributed query engines and all that kind of stuff. So you end up with a lot of uh, the, that kind of traffic behind the scenes. So a uh, quick example here is a couple of our clients have uh, query engines, I guess I'll say, behind the scenes where they have a problem of, of hundreds of machines where, hundreds of machines where uh, traffic comes into it and then it gets split up and handled out to each of these, uh, the, the, the nodes on the cluster, and you end up with a situation where uh, under, uh, you choose an HTTP semantic because it's very easy to understand, it's very common, there's a lot of tools to be able to help you debug it and take a look at it in the wire and, 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 and know what's going on. Uh, but the HTTP uh, wire protocol, the part that actually uh, goes across the TCP and that kind of stuff, ends up becoming prohibitively uh, ex expensive in the grand scheme of things. So when they were establishing like point-point connection between uh, each one of the machines in this network and you have the, the resource consumption and those kinds of things associated with starting up these connections and tearing them down and all that kind of stuff, uh, by migrating to uh, an HTTP2 uh, in place of the, the, the previous uh, implementation, they were able to uh, reduce the, the server resources and loads and those kinds of things, but, and then improve the performance of you know, something that's, that's fundamentally not exposed to the internet per se and exposed to the client browsers and those kinds of things, but uh, you know, a dramatic benefit when you, when you take a look at the, the, the wire protocol. Um, so Simone is actually going to go over here shortly on some of the examples of what HTTP2 is in case uh, I went over your heads and not understanding what HTTP2 is from a, a basic level. But uh, in a nutshell, if you want to think about it as uh, you know, opening a big pipe and being able to have one connection instead of lots and lots and the browser wars of the, the last 20 years where browsers were trying to go faster by just opening more connections to your server and all that kind of stuff. Uh, when you're talking about HTTP2, it, uh, it becomes a different load profile and that kind of stuff. And the moral there is that the costs and ben or the benefits and the savings of uh, adopting something like HTTP2, which all the browsers support now on the, the web side of things, uh, you can actually gain a lot of the benefits uh, by looking at the backend services that are using that HTTP semantic already, not have to change any of your application logic from that perspective because you're still using the same semantic, but then gain some benefits from the, the wire protocol. Uh, 
header compression is just one example of that. Uh, anyway, and then HTTP2 push is also another big component of that, which Simone will offer some examples of. And that is my cue to let him take over here. Thanks, Jesse. Um, so let's uh, dive a little bit more into the details of HTTP2. And, uh, and so, first of all, HTTP2 is a binary protocol. Uh, this is a breakthrough with respect to the HTTP 1.1 protocol because it's a textual protocol. You can actually human read it. Uh, HTTP 2, uh, it is not like that. It is binary thing. This is, um, makes things much easier for implementation to implement uh, the parsing and the generation of the protocol frames in a much more efficient way. So that was a very good thing. And how does it work? Um, so this is a, like a scheme. Every time a browser uh, creates what is called a frame. In this case, it's called a headers frame. A headers frame contains uh, uh, the request line and the request headers, and it's being sent to the server. Um, if it is a post, and so it also has a body, the request is also has a body, then uh, another frame called data frame uh, is generated by the browser, and it's sent uh, after the headers frame. So this reconstitutes the HTTP request that was uh, typically made using HTTP 1.1. And the server at that point has to reply. And it replies in the same way. So a headers frame can be reused also for responses because it just carries the information of the response line and the response headers. Uh, semantically, they're not really much different. And so the same frame can be used for both the request headers and the response headers. And of course, um, the resource content that has been requested by the browser can be delivered using one or more data frames uh, in this way. Um, another uh, very, very important feature of HTTP2 is multiplexing. Uh, so how does it work? Uh, the blue one, the blue uh, cylinder here, it's a TCP connection, okay? Typically with HTTP 1.1, what do you have? You have uh, the blue pipe, you send one request in there, and then you cannot do anything else until the response come back. So you have a huge pipe, you send a tiny little uh, amount of bytes in there, and then you have to wait for the response. With HTTP2, this is completely different. Uh, what they do is that within the same TCP connection, they create smaller pipes, the green ones, that can contain uh, single request response channels. They're called streams in HTTP2 uh, parlance. And so you can create multiple of, one, of these um, at the same time. So that's a good thing. You can actually send multiple requests at the same time on the same TCP connection. So in this case, for example, the lower pipe is the one that gets uh, uh, sent first, the request that gets sent first, top pipe sent second, and a third uh, request being sent in the middle. But the important thing is that you don't have to wait for the first one to return. Uh, for example, in this case, the middle one was a request that, that was served by the server in a faster way, maybe because the processing that required was smaller, maybe it was a small file, like for example, the favorite icon or something like that. So the, the request that was actually sent as last returns as first. So there is no correlation between uh, requests. Every single channel is independent. And so you can have out of order responses, but the browser will be able to um, uh, correlate them together and say, okay, this was the response to this particular request that I made before. And so on with the other uh, ones, right? Um, another very important feature for HP2 is headers compression. Now imagine um, if you're familiar with HTTP, um, how does it work? For example, a browser that sends a request to the server, what does it send? It sends, for example, a header string that is the user agent. Uh, it is a quite long string that says, I am Mozilla number 52, um, you know, this is my screen size and whatnot information. It's a constant string that gets sent over and over and over again for every single request that lands on your browser, okay? Same happens if you have cookies. Maybe you have large cookies that your website has sent. And so these could be kilobytes in size. And they're constant. Uh, once you get them, you have to send them for every single request that is sent over. So in HTTP2, there's a mechanism to compress these things 
in a very, very efficient way. Uh, basically, how does it work? A typical request uh, without even cookie and et cetera is 400 bytes in HTTP 1.1. In HTTP 2, the first request gets compressed already to about 250. But then HTTP 2 says, OK, I've seen this header before. Let me put it aside in, into a table. OK? And then for the second request, I don't need to compress anything. I just need a pointer to the table and say, OK, this one is the third entry in the table. And that's why you can get for subsequent requests, you can get the same 400 bytes into just 10 bytes. All right? And so this is very useful, especially if you pay for bandwidth and uh, you know, consumption of the bytes that you have on the bandwidth. So we go back to the business cases that Jesse was making before. The last feature that is paramount to how HTTP2 works is what is called HTTP2 push. Um, this is very important because the analysis that has been made in these past 20 years um, figured out that HTTP requests and responses and resources and how we render the, the web content is based of a primary resource that gets requested, which is typically an HTML page. But then when that comes back to the browser, the browser starts parsing it, and then it finds inside secondary resources that that resource links. And so it has to request those secondary resources. But there's a correlation between this primary resource and the secondary resource, right? And so by being able to push the secondary resources down, we get a lot of benefit. Let me show you how it works in practice. OK, so we have a browser, we have the server, and this is how it works with HTTP 1.1. Uh, you make the request for index.html, OK? And it's a one round trip. You get the HTML back, the parser start parsing, uh, the browser start parsing it, OK? And then it figures out, oh, look, there's a JavaScript that I have to uh, uh, request, and there's a style sheet that I have to request, OK? So I can open up to six connections to my server. And so let me open two of those and then send the request in parallel for those two resources. When the CSS come back, the browser starts parsing the CSS. And inside the CSS, it finds, oh, there's a background image that I have to request. And so it's another round trip. So just to get the resources necessary to render the simple page made of four files here, I need three round trips. Now, that's OK if you are in the United States, but the round trip uh, between Europe and the United States, East Coast, let's say it's 100 milliseconds. But if you go to Australia, that's 250 milliseconds. It's a lot of time. So just three round trips, it's already 750 milliseconds. Could be one second very easily. And this is a super small example that doesn't even uh, re recall what is the normal web page uh, in the web today. Just to give you an example, um, the normal web page today in the web has 100 secondary resources, not just one. So it is a very uh, complicated web and, and very resource intensive. So how does it work uh, on the server side? Well, the service sees these requests, and it can say, OK, I understand what's going on here. I can correlate index.html with the other three files and build a, what is called the push cache. And once I have the push cache, then an HTTP2 browser comes along and says, hey, I want index.html. But the server at this point knows that not only has to deliver back the HTML, but also the other three. And so this is what happens. Um, in one round trip, we get all the resources needed by the client to actually render the page. OK? So we just cut, by a factor of three, the time needed to fetch all the resources from the network, which is the major uh, source of latency. It's not really, I mean, the bandwidth these times is pretty high. We don't have any more like uh, 50 kilobytes or kilobits even uh, network speeds. We have now megabits stuff. So. It's not really a matter of how fast I can deliver big data. It is the latency that it takes for a TCP packet to travel from Austra Australia to United States crossing the Pacific, or from Europe to uh, United States crossing the Atlantic. So here, I would have showed a super nice demo that shows, like, it, it was very impressive. 
<laughs> of course. <laughs> I can say that. But um, yeah, we couldn't link my computer to, to, the, to the screen. So we'll skip it. And uh, this is basically what happened. So this one is Chrome 57, which is the current version, on HP 1.1 asking for the webtide.com web page, which is served in both HTTP 1.1 and HTTP 2, OK? It renders in it, you know, the, the final time the, the browser has all the resources down, it's almost one second, nine, 916 milliseconds. As you can see, there's a, this one on the, on the right is a waterfall diagram that you can see on browsers. And you can see that, for example, the first resource at the top was the index.html file. It was requested alone because the browser couldn't know what else to, to ask. OK, let me ask the index.html first. Then that guy came back, and you can see that two, four, six of other resources, the first uh, six green bars, were resources that were associated with the primary resource. So the browser said, OK, let me open six TCP connection, send those six resources to the server, and then let's wait for them to come back. They came back, and when they came back, the browser could uh, perform other requests, OK? But you can see all the green lines, the green bars there. That's time where the browser is stalled because it doesn't have enough connections to actually ask in parallel things to the server. And so it has to stall. It's like, OK, I would need to also ask for images, other G uh, JavaScript files, other CSS. But I can't because I'm waiting for the other six resources. So just to give you an idea, this works in this way. Um, you know, Get the HTML back, and then send six requests. Wait for them to come back, send another six. Wait for them to come back, send another six, and so forth. Right. So if you have, like, this, our website has 34 of them. So it's quite a number of round trip that you have to wait right? every, every single time. Then, of course, one is bigger than the other, so you can actually squeeze them in in a, in a more efficient way. But still, the point is that you can see this kind of diagram very easily. So what happens with HTTP2 instead? Uh, well, first of all, we trim down the uh, load site to less than 600 milliseconds. That's already at 30% improvement on just on that. And then see uh, the diagram, the waterfall diagram. You can see all the requests that were needed to actually render the page were sent at the same time to the server. There's no send six and then wait. It's I need 34 because I'm parsing the HTML and I'm figuring out I need 34. Boom, send the 34 up to the server and wait for them to return whenever they're ready, OK? That, of course, makes the rendering time much, much faster. Ah, but there's a catch, though. Let's see the next one. So this one was Chrome, but this one is Firefox 52, also current. Same HTTP2, renders in more than one second. What's going on? Well, let's take a look at the diagram, waterfall diagram. You see that um, it is different. It doesn't send all the resources at the same time. It actually has some kind of uh, you know, waiting for some, but then sending others and, and everything. So what's going on here? Well, basically, the implementation in Firefox is different from the one in Chrome. And they have preferred uh, certain things over others. So uh, it is just different. Uh, they've chosen a different strategy. As you can see, there's more than six uh, requests that are actually sent after the HTML, the first line at the top, came back. So it is actually HTTP2. The only problem is that um, they, they just chose a different way of doing things. Okay? And don't say, oh, now Firefox uh, performs really bad. I'm going to use Chrome forever. Okay, because that's not true. It's just a matter of choices. In fact, uh, we have tried the same stuff. This is from Europe to United States. When we tried um, to use Firefox from Australia, Firefox was consistently faster than Chrome because the latency is different. And perhaps the choices that Firefox makes in you know, deciding which resources to ask at what time are better at a better choice for longer latencies for, uh, rather than shorter latencies. 
So eh, could be different. Now, we can go back and have jokes about Microsoft browsers again, finally, because uh, this one was a clear loser. As you can see, the, the, the waterfall is kind of weird. It is, doesn't have that you know, vertical line where you can see all the resources going out together. Looks like, well, I send the first, then I pose a little bit, then I send the second, then all the others are sent like a, a small amount of time. Um, again, weird. Again, don't throw away uh, Edge just because you, you did. This actually was made on, from a US to US website because I don't have uh, Windows. But um, you know, it's impressive. It's, it's, it's a lot of difference. It, you go from 1.7 seconds of Edge to 600 milliseconds of Chrome for the same exact website. So yeah, I mean, we are here talking about HTTP2. Uh, two years later, we gained experience. It's not everything uh, perfect. Uh, there's still shadows here and there, but so we're presenting those. So yeah, big warning, mileage may vary. Um, you know, Firefox is a winner in certain cases, certain others is, uh, doesn't win, but measure, measure, measure. How do you measure? So <laughs> we had the same problem. How can we tell whether HTTP2 is actually a winner or not? So we wrote a library, a Java library, uh, that we call the Jerry Load Generator and that can process traffic uh, in HTTP 1, HTTP 2, and HTTP 2, and push. Um, and so it basically simulates what browser do, and you can have a tree of resources that gets requested exactly like a website would be, and exactly like a browser would do, and you can, uh, you can code your website in that way in, and, and see what is the difference. So we did that for our own website, and we have also simulated a 100 millisecond network round trip over the network, right, to, to get a, uh, some information about that. Because the whole point is that if you don't have network round trip, so you do this through localhost, um, this is where HTTP2 uh, performs like HTTP1. I mean, the, the network bit is the important one, because when you have to request 34 resources, and you can do it request, response, request, response, request, response. It, it's not really much different from uh, requesting all of them together and then getting them. But when you have a latency between requests and responses, so you send six, and then you have to wait for 100, 200 milliseconds, and then the response come back, and then you can, have, you can request other six, then HTTP2, as you can see here, is a clear winner. We go from 700 milliseconds to 400 to 300 with push. So we shaved off 60% of the time in rendering. So that's a, you know, like a, it, it, it's a load test, so it's fake in a sense, but it shows that there is a lot of benefit in doing that. But then you have to measure on your own website, but it would be, uh, you know, a particular situation where HTTP2 is not a clear winner in optimal condition. We'll see later that there are a couple of conditions where HTTP2 doesn't really shine with respect to HTTP1, but they are corner cases. Okay, uh, who's convinced now that he has to move to HTTP2 here? Oh, come on. Okay, cool. So how do you do that? And so. The thing is that HTTP2 and browser require TLS. If you want to deploy a website, then it will only work over HTTP2 if you're using TLS. TLS meaning SSL, right? So certificates and everything. You have to have HTTPS in the front of your URLs. Um, but that also gives you, if you are over TLS, better Google ranking. So why not? It's, it's a good thing. Plus. Let's Encrypt now gives certificates for free. So you don't have to pay 200 bucks a year or more for all your uh, certificates. You can get them for free with Let's Encrypt. The renewal process is very straightforward and um, you know, it's pretty easy. So what is the case of deploying HTTP2 when you have non-browser client? Typical case is, um, I don't know, uh, microservices where you have a 
HTTP client that calls a REST API on a backend server from an internal, uh, uh, an internal server in your data center. Well, you can clear text. It's, I mean, HTTP2 doesn't mandate uh, TLS. It is only that browser vendors decided, oh, we're not going to implement HTTP2 over clear text. We'll just go straight uh, TLS, and that's it. And that's the only option that we'll give. But inside the data center, you can have Java clients that speak HTTP2 that can communicate over clear text with the server. This is a typical deployment. Apache and Nginx both support HTTP2. The problem is that they support HTTP2 only towards the browsers. When you configure Nginx or Apache in reverse proxy mode, which is the typical deployment that you, that you do, uh, and then talking to a Java uh, server in the backend, they speak HTTP 1.1 on the backend. Uh, this is bad because applications are deployed inside the server container, typically, the word files, right? And so it is those applications that have the, the, the understanding and the capability to decide, oh, I will need to push this resource associated every time I get this request. Uh, and so they decide what, what's needed to push, OK? And if they cannot push because the protocol is HTTP 1.1, then they will not push. And if they don't push, then the front end guys cannot push. And therefore, you lose one of the biggest benefits of HTTP 2. And so while this is a very common deployment scenario, it's really not the optimal one. OK? What we recommend instead is this deployment here. Uh, we use a different uh, load balancer uh, software called HAProxy uh, that can tunnel, uh, can do TLS offloading, and then can tunnel clear text HTTP2 to the backend. When you have an end-to-end -end solution that is based on, based on HTTP2, then when, that's when you get the full benefit of HTTP2. Because now application can push to HA proxy, which will just get the bytes and send them over, encrypt them, and then send them over to the client. And the browser is super happy with, uh, with what's, what's going on. So uh, super, uh, that's, that's the best configuration that's, that's possible. So point being that we are, after two years, still in that transition where um, Nginx and, and Apache can support HTTP2 on one side, but not on the backend side, OK? Um, and so we kind of need to push uh, these uh, projects to say, hey, OK, can you support HTTP2 also towards the backend? Because that's really needed. That's important for this kind of deployments. We can do more things if this is possible. If we're still stuck on a 20 years old protocol, then you know there's not much progress that we can make. And we're not just picking on those two projects. No, no, it's exactly, all exactly. I mean, they're 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 super, super cool project. The point is here is that the best solution would be an end-to-end -end, uh, HTTP/2 chain uh, towards the server. What about Java? Uh, server four. Uh, which is due very soon. Um, I've heard from the spec leaders uh, that is going to be probably, you know, uh, this summer. Um, it is going to support HTTP2. It will have additional API in the servlet API that will allow you to programmatically push resources and, uh, and therefore get, um, you know, a hold in the API of these HTTP2 features. Um, and so, uh, this will be good if you write servlet directly. Uh, you will be able to actually use this API directly. If you based uh, your application on frameworks like Spring or whatnot, uh, then the frameworks will be able to uh, get uh, use this API and maybe offer uh, a similar API to applications uh, that will eventually call the servlet API. And so. In any case, from your application, you will be able to push resources based on your own logic. Um, JDK 8 is required. Who is it in a JDK version that is less than 8, like 7? OK, a few. Um, JDK 8 is required because the implementation in JDK 8 requires the strong ciphers that HTTP 2 mandates. And so uh, 
you need to move to JDK8 uh, if you want to use uh, HTTP2. Not only that, but we work together with the JDK team on what is called the JAP244 to support a particular feature that is required by HTTP2 that is called ALPN. So this feature was missing in the JDK, and without it, you cannot do HTTP2. And so we worked together with the JDK team, uh, the JDK team, uh, worked together, and, and others, uh, worked together with the JDK team, and uh, we have now this uh, API in JDK 9, uh, since uh, JDK 9 build um, 150, uh, if I remember well. And we have already implemented this in JETI. Yesterday, we released uh, JETI 943. It contains already the modules that use this new API in JDK 9 to uh, leverage the JDK 9 native support for ALPN. And so these are the new APIs that have been added to SSL parameters and SSL engine. Uh, that allow uh, you to, uh, well, allow us, basically the, the servlet implementers, to leverage uh, the possibility to, to uh, use ALPN, which is required for HTTP2. So right now, there's a bunch of tricks that we have to make to <laughs> make HTTP2 works, uh, but you know this one will be totally fine. So uh, this is really good. What else? Um, this is the support in the Java world. So Jetty 9.4, we actually support that since Jetty 9.3. Um, we have server and client. So you can do whatever, for example, you can write tests. You can write a REST client. You can you know, leverage that. Uh, Tomcat 8.5 supports HTTP2. Uh, it has been backported from Tomcat 9. Uh, Wildfly 9, Undertow 1.3, Netty 4, uh, OK, HTTP is a client that supports HTTP2 for Android. Um, there was um, a JAP 110 to create an HTTP2 client API inside the JDK. That JAP was targeted for JDK 9, but it has been moved to the incubator uh, project. And so it will not be part of the official JDK 9 API. It is now in the incubator. Um, you're, you're welcome to play with it and report back feedback on how do you feel the API is going. Uh, but you know, it's, it's, uh, it's something that it's, it's there. I mean, HTTP 2 is something that everybody recognizes. It's now time to move to that. And so we need API to support that. We need uh, uh, you know, low-level features like ALPN. Uh, we need to support all of that. Uh, we provide, the JIRA project provides a pure HTTP2 client, but we also provide a semantic, a higher level HTTP client only. So when you request a resource to a server, you, you're basically saying something. You, you're saying, I want to get this URI, okay? Now, how this, this thing that you want to do gets translated into the actual wire protocol that goes over the network that's kind of irrelevant. You have expressed the, um, the will to get a particular URI. And then this can be transported in the HTTP 1.1 format, which is you know, classic uh, everybody, uh, well, not everybody, but you know, it's, it's pretty familiar, uh, but can also be translated into the HTTP 2 format. It's the same semantic, but different transport, different bytes that run over the network. And so, this is the only difference that you have to make to use the HTTP client, which is the high-level client in Jetty, uh, configured with the default HTTP 1.1 transport, and below, configured with the HTTP 2 transport. That's it. That's the only change that you have to make. Then, once you have that instance, you can use the same instance in your application in the same way. You don't change a single byte in your application once you can inject uh, a pre-configured HTTP client into your application. So you can do that in Spring configuration file, CDI, whatever you want, and then your application doesn't change, and you get the benefit of using HTTP2. Eh, let's go to the issues a little bit, and uh, let's see what are the issues and how they are uh, addressed. So HTTP2 is two years old now. It's a relatively new protocol. There is a lot of room for optimization. We have already seen this. Uh, you know, Firefox and Chrome took different decisions on how to optimize the, in, the request 
how they send out requests. And so they're still uh, trying every time. And every time you get a new browser version, there's a very good chance that that logic has already changed. And I myself, I, I find that the logic actually changed in Chrome from version, I think the last one that I uh, saw in detail was 53, and now it's 57. And the logic they're sending out HTTP request has already changed. So they're still working a lot, gathering data, seeing what is the best patterns that they can use for that. So um, you know, it's, it's, it's a moving thing uh, towards better and better and better HTTP2. Uh, there's a lot of difference between implementation in both clients and server, even Nginx or Apache or Jetty or Tomcat or whatever. We're continuously gathering data and say how we can do this better. And for example, Jetty 9.3 versus Jetty 9.4, the implementation at the HTTP2 level, the scheduling and the interleaving of how the frames are returned back to the client has completely changed because we figured out that the Jetty 9.3 version was not as optimal as could have been. And so we changed that in 9.4, and it's now better. So proxies and load balancer are unfortunately not yet up to speed. If you, I mean, some of them are, but they all kind of share this problem of HTTP 1.1 communication to the backend. So F5 or other load balancer and, and others um, are not really up to pair. So it's OK. Sometimes it's OK. Uh, you don't want to, you know, radically change your whole uh, deployment architecture that you have in place. Uh, you still want to get some benefit from HTTP2, for example, just for multiplexing. Um, but, you know, uh, there are solutions. HAProxy is one of these solutions. So, you know, you're, you're welcome to experiment and push vendors. You know, send an email to the Apache mailing list or Nginx mailing list. Say, hey, can I have this? Um, and then, you know, when I get 100 emails, so of those, then they will do it. Like we did it, because <laughs> they asked that the, the same stuff. So uh, TLS everywhere, I spoke about that already, but you know, solved problem already. It's just a matter of, you know, 10 minutes there figuring out how Let's Encrypt works. It's really no more than 10 minutes, you're done. Um, there are new problems though, like cloud confidentiality. If you terminate TLS at the cloud edge, and there are other customers in the cloud, they can peek at your traffic. So maybe you don't want to offload TLS at the cloud edge. You want to forward the, the encrypted uh, traffic up to your server, or you want to be sure that the cloud gives you a pr completely private virtual network so that nobody can actually peek at the data that it's on your network, right? Very common pattern here is Docker container deployed yeah. wherever, and then inside of the Docker container, it's running an HA proxy, and that's the thing that terminates SSL, and then it passes it along. Yeah, yeah, you can, you can compose Docker containers in that way, and so you have a you know, Docker container with HA proxy, and then one with uh, Java in it, and so forth, you compose, and one with Jetty. We have a, official uh, Jetty instance in Docker, so you're, you're free to look it up and use it. And so, yeah, um, there are technical solutions to uh, most of this problem. HP2 mandates one connection per domain. This is very efficient, reduces a lot the number of resources that a server and a client have to use, but has one big drawback. If there is packet loss at the TCP level, well, that's your only connection. And if there is a packet loss and you have 20, 30 outstanding requests in there, they will all be stalled until the packet loss can be recovered by TCP, by a retransmission, but they will all be stalled. And so there are cases, for example, Fastly did a very interesting study on this. Fastly is a CDN. Uh, at this uh, YouTube address, you can see a presentation by one of the Fastly guys. Uh, very, very interesting. They measured the packet loss in the United States. So they figured out that 80% of the connections had basically zero packet loss. Uh, but 10% had up to 1% packet loss, and another 10% had more than 1%, 1.5% packet loss. And so for that 20%, HTTP2 was actually not working that well with respect with HTTP1. Why is that? Because with HTTP1, you have six connections open, okay? Maybe just one suffers from packet loss, 
but the other five, they're still running good. So they are taking their resources and then returning them. And then that single request that it's on, on the you know, unfortunate uh, TCP connection that got packet loss, well, uh, hey, you know, we'll wait a little bit more, it's gonna arrive eventually, but you know, not immediately. Um, but the other five, five connections will work fine. Now for HTTP2, that's not the case because there's only one connection. So again, test, try, uh, measure. measure, exactly. But there is a new project from Google, a new protocol, that tries to address this problem as well. The protocol is called Quick, and it is based on UDP rather than TCP. And so because it's based on UDP, it's now connectionless. It's just UDP packet that flow the internet. And there are many benefits. The protocol has been designed to resolve a lot of problems that TCP currently has, and especially TCP, TCP for the web. Uh, so for example, there is a zero round trip connection establishment. Um, right now, uh, the TCP protocol works in a way that you have to send a SYN packet, get the SYN response back, and then you know it's a round trip uh, to, to establish the connection. Um, but, but this one is zero round trip. Uh, there are tricks in TCP as well to, to achieve zero round trip, but you know it's uh, it's okay. Well, Quick has been designed from the ground up to, to support this feature. Um, it support independent multiplexed streams, so you can actually send multiple UDP packets using Quick, and each of those will be representing a single stream. And because it's a single stream, if I lose one of those packets, all the others will not be lost. Uh, because they're UDP packets. One may get lost, but the other will arrive. And so because of that, you don't stall the whole TCP connection because you need a, retry, a TCP retry. Um, they are, uh, Quick is much more resistant to packet loss. Uh, it has built-in built crypto features, and it supports uh, what is called connection migration and not rebinding, which is, for example, when you have your mobile phone and you go from Wi-Fi to mobile network to back to Wi-Fi, every time it is a network change that if you're using TCP, it's a different network. You get a different IP address and, it, and it's all complicated. You have to kill one connection and open a new one. And so Quick doesn't have this problem. It's, um, it's designed to support that feature as well. Uh, but what is the problem with Quick? Well, by mixing transport concerns, crypto concerns, and application concerns, there are, there are people that recoiled in horror because, because the history of protocols over the internet has always been that we layer them one on top of the other. We have a transport protocol, we layer a crypto protocol on top of that, and then we layer an application to protocol on top of that. We don't want a protocol that does everything together because then it's, you know, the story has told us, well, it didn't work in the past. Why we want to go that direction? The HTTP so, Working Group is one of the most entertaining mailing lists on the internet, I think. Yeah, because there are people that has, there are super smart people in there that has tons of experience and, you know, they have, very strong opinions of what should be done and what not. So it's Pauline in camp, by the way, is the guy behind Varnish, the cache. So it is one that knows a lot about this stuff. So plus, Quick needs to re-implement a, a couple of TCP, TCP features. Uh, first of one is congestion control, and the second one is loss recovery. I mean, UDP packet can be lost, but you don't just lose them, it, it, you want, okay, that's lost, I need to resend it. So you need to re-implement this in user space. It's not anymore a feature that the TCP kernel stack of your Linux box gives to you for free. It is something that you have to re-implement in user land. And so when you see all this in, you know, as for example, we would do it in Java as part of the Jetty server. And so when we look at this, we say, wow, this is a lot of effort to do because we have to crack out TCP, uh, UDP, we have to crack out TLS in UDP, and we have to crack out congestion control and loss recovery. And so every one of these features is a lot of effort to implement and implement right. And so it's a, a larger- A little bit of recoiling, recoiling in horror. 
yeah, it's a big a bit of effort, but we'll see where we go. So conclusions. The good thing is that for web developers, there's basically zero change that you have to make, okay? Your application will be able to leverage uh, HP2 push with Server 4 coming on. Um, you don't need to work around HP 1.1 limitation that you used to be, like for example, you know, packaging all your CSS files into a single file to reduce the number of requests or you know, image spriting, other HP 1.1 hacks and stuff like that. JDK 9 is up to, uh, up to speed and um, you know, it's, it's good. Um, you just need to move to a server that supports HTTP 2, that's it. Take your WAR, deploy in Jetty, done. Uh, for deployers though, uh, so DevOps, SysOps, um, they need to take care of TLS renewals, for example. And so you have to install a process in your company to say, okay, we, need to we didn't have certificates before, but now we need them, and now there must be someone that every three months, which is the default expiration time for Let's Encrypt certificates, or every year, has to figure out what to do with the certificate, or renew that, or maybe add a new domain that, that's now required because your business has expanded. Um, you wanna always keep Java up to date. Uh, that's a good thing anyway, because uh, you wanna leverage uh, security uh, uh, fixes that Java uh, puts in from time to time. You wanna upgrade your server container, and you wanna take a look, a close look at your network infrastructure. You wanna be sure that your load balancer and every network component that you have in between uh, actually works. If you don't own the network infrastructure, then you have to look at your uh, cloud provider and say, okay, do you support this? Uh, can I do HTTP2? Um, and if not, politely ask him, uh, well, you know, why not? Can I have it? Because otherwise, um, you know, there may be other offerings that I can uh, examine or evaluate. So HTTP2, it is a good move in, in most of the cases. Uh, when you get uh, problems like the packet loss or something like that, typically the grades to something close to uh, HTTP 1.1 may be slightly worse than that, but in average, 80%, like I showed before, it's going to be much, much better. And uh, being faster and better means more money for your business. So HTTP 2, at the end, it is all about your business and making money and stuff like that. Thank you.